Grimm, Dr. Larry Grimm, with the program Don't Just Age, Engage. What is the power of story in our lives? What is the power, is the power of the stories we tell ourselves in our lives? I am a life coach for elderhood. I engage people who are wanting to, to pursue their lives into the best, most extraordinary elderhood of their life. They have, we each of us have a childhood, we have an, a, a teenage adolescence, we have an adulthood, and then now we have an elderhood, become much more of, a, of an acceptable and, and useful con um, concept since the 90s. What are you doing in your elderhood? What are you, stories are you telling yourself in your elderhood? And how do those stories impact the decisions you make? In my book, uh, Don't Just Age, Engage, Life Coaching for an Extraordinary Elderhood, I explored five spiritual tasks, which I think are pertinent to and certainly prominent in our elderhood experience. So in continuing to grow up, if we approach these, with intelligence and with uh, a willingness to explore them and to resolve what they what sometimes some challenges they they present to us. The first one is grieving, and we addressed that last the last uh, program we had. Lots of grieving when we get to elderhood. We sort out our stories, sorting out our stories as we go th through elderhood. Um, what are those stories that we want to keep? What are some of the stories we want to change? What are the stories me maybe are through living one of this card forgiving is uh, the is the third one and then we go on from forgiving to pre preparing and on to letting go and we'll explore those in future uh, programs every two weeks here on think tech Hawaii and I'm so grateful for the partnership of think tech Hawaii that allows and enables me along with so many other great and wonderful hosts and programs to bring critical considerations to my viewers, to our viewers in the, uh, in the Hawaiian islands here where we are and beyond throughout the world. So welcome to this. Aloha, your friends that I just haven't met yet. So glad you're here. Today to look at the power of story, I'm inviting one of my dear friends who is a life coach for lifestyle and health, Mary Steck in California, who's come on to us in the Zoom platform. Hello, Mary. Good afternoon, Larry. I'm so pleased to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Oh, you're so welcome. And thank you for, for being willing to bring your expertise and your insights and your sensitivity to people and the kinds of changes we go through. Well, um, I'd like to invite you, if you will, to share a little bit about yourself, however you would like to introduce yourself to, to the viewers. Well. You know, we, uh, you and I had a lovely conversation yesterday and I have made a few notes, but I forgot to make notes about myself because that's usually how it is. Um, I am a health and lifestyle coach and um, I've been a studier of spirituality and self-improvement, self-development for most of my life. I, had, I was blessed with a mother who had me in uh, um, an alternate, alternative thinking tank so um, it's kind of who I am. I'm like I said. I'm very, very happy to be here. And this subject is one of my favorites. Yeah, I thought it might be. Yeah, um, it really I've, is. I've seen you work with people, um, and the changes that they that come about from changing their stories. So, what is the power of story in your lives, Mary? Well, you know, I as a health coach, I've been working for several years with people who are, are challenged with with weight issues. And they have their own particular stories. But I want to go back from the beginning. As I said, I've made a few notes. You know, you're in Hawaii. And um, most of the, I'm sure all of the people watching this know the, um, the, the two words talk story. And I've kind of been, I've been thinking about that. What does that really mean? Talk story. And I, spent this this afternoon actually dividing that up into three different categories of talking story. The first category that um, I've identified is the category of experience. And those are the stories of our memories and the cultural stories that have been passed down through the ages, 
those stories of teaching, those stories that enlighten, that instill love and inspire and make people laugh. Um, the memories of vacations and family and pets, those are those wonderful experiential stories that we cherish. The second grouping of stories are the beliefs. Now this category are kind of are the ones that are self-inflicted. They're the ones that we pick up as children. Um, you know, we hear the, the, the word no, I think it's 5,000 times before we're three years old. Uh, and it starts building a self-image. And in that self-image, we, we, we start adopting stories like, I can't, I can't do this. I always fail. You know, if somebody says, you're a bad boy. That's a story. That's a, that's the seed of a story. And those stories we, we take with us. It's they're manufactured stories. Um, I can't, I can never make money. I can never save money. I can't get out of debt. Nothing ever works for me. Uh, it's just my luck. I'm a loser. You know, I'm bad at marriage or I can't lose weight because I'm big boned. That's, that's, one of the ones that, I, that I've experienced with, in my work with people who are losing weight, or I'm just too old. Excuse me, let me interrupt you just a minute because I have, you triggered a remem uh, memory I have of my grandson, Ethan, who is six years, six years old. And he was talking with his mom one day, she reported to me and she said, you know, mom, he said, you know, mom, sometimes I just make bad choices. I'm not a very good boy. And uh, <laughs> I don't know where she picked that up. I'm sure, I, he did. I mean, I mean, he sure he didn't pick it up from his mother because she wouldn't say something like that. But somewhere he picked that up. And so, in my response to him, I next time I saw him on Facebook or on Facetime uh, or it was Zoom, actually, I said, "Ethan, you're my, sometimes I make mistakes, but it's just mistakes. And Ethan, you make mistakes too. And you're a wonderful boy." And it was so funny, Mary, because he just glowed with this concept that, that I think he's a wonderful boy well, and the power of that. Go ahead, Mary. Yeah. I mean, can you imagine being raised by parents who are consciousness, conscious enough to enforce that positivity and of self-image in you? Yes, you go to school and you, you don't get picked for the team. Therefore, I'm a loser. No, but the, the problem with this is those experiential stories actually start dominating the tuck story, the memory story. You know, it, we, we kind of live on scales and yeah. then you, yeah. you run your life based on these false stories and they, they're false. And I'm going to give you a little tool because I, I realize that a lot of times on, on programs like this, we tell you all the things that are wrong, but we don't give you a, give you a tool to fix it, right? Good, 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 good. Let's go with it. Um, so the third level that that I came up with is the someday story. As we mature, and we reach retirement, or it's a it's a dream state. It's a fantasy state. Uh -huh. um, someday I'm going to get up and and play. You know, learn a new game someday I'm going to take a vacation, someday. And that, does, that begins another loop that is, um, it, it reinforces the I'm not, because if you don't take action, then you get into this fantasy state and the fantasies never come true. Therefore, oh, I knew I couldn't do that. You see? Right. So you, you self-inflict again a, a story of failure because you set yourself up right. in the someday routine. Is that what you're saying? That's exactly what I'm saying. It's based on the fantasy. Wouldn't it be wonderful if I took a trip around the world? Well, yeah, that would be wonderful. But if you don't get into action and, do, and make it happen, then you have another failure to deal with. And it's just this endless loop, you know? Yeah. Um, so like uh, so someday in the... And yes. so, so as a coach, what do you do to uh, move people through that? Well, you know, I, that I, this is again, uh, as I said, that we always give the problems, but not the, the solutions. 
Uh, I'm sure most of us have had uh, an Aunt Tilly who, when we get together for Thanksgiving, we sit down or whenever dinner and we sit down and Aunt Tilly starts her old stories over and over again. It's like, okay, here we go again. Here's Aunt Tilly. And wouldn't you like to just, in a very nice way, just cut it off, stop her story in a nice way. I mean, I'm talking not, I'm not, this is virtual. So there is a tool that you can use and it's, it's actually, it's, it's like the, it's a karate chop tool. So when you, when we start feeling stories, you know, come up, the first thing is a gut check, a body check is what I'm thinking true. You know, we, you know, Byron Katie asks herself, you know, she, he, she teaches three questions. Is this true? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Is this really true? Are you absolutely sure? All right. I, I'm, I'm unlucky in love. Is that true? Is it really true? You know, and you go through that and you really get down to really answering that. And then you have a you, you you can kind of feel it in your body. Are you constricted when you when you make a statement about yourself? Mm -hmm. I'm a bad piano player, or I'm whatever that's negative. Do you feel a constriction in your body, um, and or do you feel an expansion? If you do an affirmation, I am strong. I am clear. Yeah. You have an actual body feeling. You know. Um, and so when you can feel that constriction start happening, you can actually, and the thoughts running, you can actually do a karate chop. You can go, stop, stop, stop. and stop. exactly. And you, you, you wake up, you go, oh yeah, I'm wow. doing that again. That's great. That's a great tool to be alert to what's going on, to change it then, stop, Consider what it is, and then change it. That's right. That's right. So, how how when you work with people as a coach, how, do you recognize some of those stories that they've been telling themselves, and do you invite them to pause? What do you do when you hear those stories? Well, a lot of times I ask them to leave their stories on the on the door before they enter the room. Ah. They're allowed to have them. Uh, you know, if they want them, that's fine, but they can, they can park them outside the room uh, uh -huh. and then pick them up on the way, on the way back if they choose, you know, and we don't, gotta, we don't have choices. Uh, and, and empathetically listen without judgment. And that's, as a coach, that's a whole other dynamic. As you know, we are we listen without taking it on empathy is something that's kind of a dangerous trap you can hear it and then start wearing it or you can hear it and feel it and hand it back if you know what i mean yeah, sure. but i also ask people to seek tiny little victories tiny little victories even if it's one push-up against the wall Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, I'm too heavy to do exercises. I, can you do one push-up against the wall? Do one a day. Mm -hmm. And that starts developing the serotonins because of the success. And it starts feeling good. And it starts breaking that addiction to the cortisol that's created when you're feeling bad and sorry, and you're in the negative spin. And your body starts going and your brain starts saying, I like this part better than the other. I like feeling good better than I, I like feeling bad. So little tiny successes. And as seniors, you know, we don't have to grow old. I, I decided a long time ago, I'm old. <laughs> um, I'm rediscovering myself. I'm 74 and I'm rediscovering myself all over again because I've decided I can. Yeah. Yeah. And, and those are the decisions to make. And if you can take one tiny action step, if you want to paint for the first time in your life as a senior, just go buy a brush. Right. 
I, uh, I have an older brother, Rand, my older brother Randy is in uh, California, Southern California as well, Mary, close, well, down in San Diego, the San Diego area. And uh, Randy's just stayed in great shape. He's doing really well. And uh, we've been talking a little bit about elderhood. And, <clears throat> and he essentially is saying he's not, he's, he says, I'm not, not really an elder. So denial is, is, is uh, more than a river. In, in Egypt, and but it serves him well to be able to keep telling himself that he's going to stay vital, he's going to stay younger, and he's not going to. He says, if you lose it, you know, if you, if you don't use it, you lose it. Um, these are kind of some of the story snippets of his story that he keeps bringing up to himself, and um, and but it's it speaks about the story that people have about elderhood too. What do you notice in elder people that you work with, elderhood people, people in this stage of life? What are some of the stories that you hear from them about aging? Hmm, that's very interesting. Um, I, a few years ago, I met a gentleman who was um, in a memory care unit. He was mm -hmm. quite, he had pretty, um, advanced dementia and every time I would see him a huge smile on his face how are you I'm fantastic everything was fantastic we would walk outside isn't the sky beautiful look at that beautiful flower that everything he saw everything that he allowed in his mind was beautiful and mm. fabulous. And I spent a little time with him a few days, you know, just visiting. And then I finally had a chance to take him home, drive him home. And I, and I, I went, I took him home and I, I, his wife came out and I said, may I ask you a question? I said, I, um, I've noticed that his world is perfect. How did you do that? He, she said, we cultivated it for oh. years. We planted only positive affirmations and feelings for years because there were, uh, there's Alzheimer's in his family. And he knew that, you know, he was losing some capacities. And I realized that what we plant in our, in our subconscious and cultivate and feed is what we will be left with when our mental capacities start diminishing. Mm -hmm. So to make a choice as we enter elderhood of, of priming your 90 year old mind, how do I want to live? Do I wanna be that curmudgeon that, you know, the guy that nothing pleases him and life kind of sucks? You know, yeah, or, yeah. or the guy that isn't this wonderful. Yeah. I heard a story, Mary, of neurolinguistic programming people who had had known a woman who was in attendance at their one of their conferences and seminars, and and knew that this woman had been um, abused as a child and really severely abused, and. Uh, after, afterwards, they talked with her and they said, it's so wonderful that you're here and you're doing so well. And how, how is it that you became such a, a great success in your life after what you've experienced as a child and young adult and young, uh, young person? And she said, well, I decided I was going to rewrite my history. And I wrote my story of my family as though it were the perfect family that I could possibly want. And I rewrote my story and that's what I live by. That's right. The power of story. Um, our histories are really not records of incidents. Our histories are impressions of our experience. They are ways in which we do that memory. And they get filed in that hippocampus in that middle, um, <clears throat> that middle range of our brain, that middle brain, where all the feelings of belonging, longing, of loving, of caring, of wondering, of 
scare out of fear. They get they get lodged in there, and um, uh, and they control our response, which often is a reaction to um, to circumstances. So, how can a person who has their story about themselves lodged there so strongly? How how can they deal with that story and get rid of it, or or how can they get beyond its grasp into something that's creative and life affirming? Well, I think life affirming is is a magical affirming your life every day, gratitude every day. I have stories. We all have stories. Mm -hmm. Are they going away? I don't know that they're going away, but I know I've got better stories that I refer to. You know, in my mind, my my brain is a is a library. Which book do I want to take off the shelf today and read? Excellent. You know, I I just it, it's overriding. It's over. It's constantly. You know, when when you wake up in the morning, and this I do every single day. Wake up in the morning and say, "I want to. I get to. And I choose to." Ah. Right. Whatever task you have ahead of me, of your, of you, I, it's today I'm facing a new day, and I want to, I get to, and I choose to make this the best day of my life. That must uh, must every day awaken you. You awaken with a sense of power, strength. What else? Uh, gratitude. And gratitude. For being able to make the choice, yeah. and that's the thing I think we forget is that we we have a choice to live our old stories over and over that old record they never wear out they, they get scratched but they never wear out or change the record mm -hmm. yeah i am i'm so saddened by our society which looks at elderhood as a, um, a place of victimhood you get to elder and you become a victim and certainly if i surrender to all the changes without feeling as though I have a choice or knowing how to make those choices, having a community that wants to support those positive choices. And I, in effect, I do go into depression and victimhood and uh, my gosh, especially with COVID-19, how many elders are sitting at home isolated from their family, isolated from their communities and and what, what dominates, what story then dominates their mind when they wake up? Very few of us probably have this. I can, I, what was the, what, what were the phrases? I want to, I, I want get to. to, and I choose to. I want to, I get to, and I choose to. But you so. know, elders are, if you, if you look at the Native American culture, the elders are the wise ones. Right. They are the wise ones. And we have stories. We go back to the talk story part of, of my little you know, scenario. Mm -hmm. Write them down. I'm writing memories down. I'm writing little, little stories in my life. And I'll just take one example, one experience, and I'll just write it out. I'll relive it. We are creative, intelligent, wise individuals who have reached a point in our life where we may not have to work any longer. We have time to create and to share, to talk story and to teach and to enlighten and make people laugh. Don't give up on your stories. Don't put them away. Absolutely. Absolutely right, Mary. And, no. that, gives, and that gives a, a kind of purposefulness to, uh, to all those experiences can you, because you can pass them along. Oh yeah, and I, and I I recommend also uh, doing a video, doing a video of those, and making the video available to the grandkids five years from now, ten years from now, when they wonder what was Grandpa really like. Right, right. <laughs> and what did and, Grandpa do during the war? <laughs> and but we we did do. I mean, we've gone through our generation has changed the world, and we need to own that. We are sixties and seventies kids. Absolutely, Mary. And, and there's value in that. You know, Og Mandino wrote this, and I love this. It says, weak is who 
Weak is he who permits his thoughts or stories to control his actions. Strong is he who forces his actions to control his thoughts. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Very good. Who, whose was that? Who said Agamandino. Agamandino. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's great. So take action and control your thoughts. Don't they're not they're not real. Those old beliefs, those old stories aren't real. Yeah, yeah there, there are two reasons that I, I've been a church person. I know there are two reasons in the belief systems that we leave belief systems. One, one reason is because they no longer fulfill our personal needs. So we have to look elsewhere for personal strength, personal nurture. Um, I mean, there are some horrible horrible individuals, uh, individual beliefs about individuals that have perpetrated uh, abuse and uh, self, self flagellation, self abuse has been horrible. So it may not fulfill the needs of the individual. The other reason is because we have a vision of what can be and the system of belief doesn't move us up. It just wants to keep us locked in. So many people feel locked into the belief system that they have and want to get beyond and nudge themselves up into something new and visionary. So well, that's part of what coaching is about too. Certainly what's part of what a, a nurturing family experience is about. Help you change your story. What are the stories that you viewers use in your life to tell yourself? What are the stories that you start with? I always, because nobody always does anything. <laughs> Or what are the stories that you say, I never can. Nobody never can. You always have an exception. There are no absolutes in that sense. So I encourage you, please take a look at your stories. Mary, thank you so much for this. I have really, really enjoyed, of course, the opportunity to be with you in this context. Thank you. And, and I must, I must. Wisdom and reflection. Great. And I thank you for being there. We have one minute left. Okay, I'm going to say, I'm going to interrupt you this time. And I'm going to just say that you are doing such a service for the community and of the world by, by, by bringing this gift to them and recognizing this part of life that's so valuable and precious. It's a gift. You're a gift. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, Mary. Eric, would you bring up that website here's my website a global community for your extraordinary elderhood and under that if you would I want, like to purchase my ebook go to the digital resource center and you'll find don't age just don't just age engage don't be a victim be empowered to make an extraordinary elderhood and aloha see you in two weeks we'll return with the third piece of aging uh, extraordinarily, and that is forgiving. Come back. Aloha. Peace.